Hello and welcome to the Business Standard Morning Show. I'm Nazia Iqbal and here's a look at the stories for the day. Ramu, you want tea? अरे नहीं यार एक चाय कॉफी वी इंडियन डिसग्री ऑन एवरी थिंग बट वी अग्री एस बी आई इज द बैंक टू एवरी इंडियन एस बी आई का होम लोन आई एग्री विद यू एस बी आई इज द बैंक टू एवरी इंडियन द समर मेड एन अर्ली एंट्री दिस ईयर नाजिंग पीपल टू स्विच ऑन ए सी कूलर्स एंड फैन इन द मिडल ऑफ मार्च बट कूलिंग कम्स एट अ कॉस्ट टर्म्स एंड टर्म्स ऑफ कोल इज बर्न इन पावर प्लान टू कीप द होम्स एंड ऑफिस कोल्ड एंड जस्ट लाइक लास्ट समर coal stock is dwindling again namura said that most power plants are grappling with coal shortage and hinted at power crisis watch our next report to know more about the current situation and what could be done to address it this year's march was the hottest in over a century leading to an earlier than usual surge in electricity demand the big mismatch in demand and supply forced several states to resort to power cuts india gets 75% of its electricity from coal and the average coal stocks at domestic power plants have fallen to 9 days as of mid april the lowest in at least 8 years this is way lower than the government mandated norm of an average 24 days of stop it prompted the all india power engineers federation to warn of an impending energy crisis in 12 states the shortage of electricity as a percentage of demand has shot up to 1.4% this month compared to 1.1% in october when india last faced a serious coal shortage bihar jharkhand Haryana and Uttarakhand are facing an electricity deficit of more than 3% each while Andhra Pradesh is facing a power shortage of 8.7%. According to Central Electricity Authority, as of April 17, out of 173 plants that it tracks, 101 are left with critical levels of coal stock. To supply coal to the thermal power stations, 453 wagons are required. while only 379 were available in the first week of april which has now increased to 415 but the shortage is worsening the supply crisis state run coal india which accounts for 80% of india's coal output increased its production by 27% in the first half of april but the world's largest coal mining firm said the escalating demand driven up by post pandemic economic buoyancy and hotter than normal summer seem to be dwarfing the supply increase Coal India has sharply reduced supplies to the non-power sector which includes aluminum smelters, cement factories and steel mills despite record production. It raised its supplies to the power sector by 14% in the first half of April. Nomura has said that if supply does not catch up with the demand, it would result in more power outages in summer and a diversion of coal from non-power sectors weighing on industrial output and increasing electricity costs. This can become another stagflationary shock it warned. So why does India face a recurring coal shortage and how can this issue be addressed like 2014 and 2017 in 2021 also power generating companies did not maintain the minimum mandatory stocks as a result the central government was forced to stop or highly reduce the coal supplies and coal rake supplies to industries and captive generators now that's a cycle which is happening and going on that needs to stop when coal is give, not given to captive generation a part of it uh, draws from the grid and that adds to the uh, you know increasing consumption power plants for whatever and number of reasons did not maintain the stocks and effectively no action has been taken against those individuals who are responsible for this mess the cost of coal at the pit head is around 400 rupees average that coal Coal India says my cost is thirteen hundred rupees. That bit head on four hundred rupees actual cost. Government charges four hundred rupees as green cess, and on top of it there is uh, almost thirty percent or forty percent worth of other taxes and royalties. Now that everything makes in place of like thirteen uh, hundred cost. Of course, uh, Coal India will expect some profit. So definitely for them. the uh, selling cost is 1600 rupees the coal cost is actually inflated because of high level of inefficiencies 
in the whole India system, which has been historically created. How we can afford that? Overall, coal cost and power cost has to come down by drastic uh, measures. Uh, you can consolidate the demand and you can reduce the prices of coal. And once the coal prices come down for railway, also you know uh, the power cost is very high. And since the power cost is high, so they charge higher for the coal transportation, and that makes the coal costlier. See, ultimately, what happens when when the discounts are at a loss, they will not pay. to the gen, gen, gen generator companies yeah. generator companies will not pay to coal india so it's a cycle even as power outages rise the coordination between power coal and railway ministries has also come to the fore ashok khurana director general of the association of power producers told business standard that the blame game has always plagued this power sector coal india on its part said that it is coordinating with these ministries to build up stocks at power plants but exhorted plants designed to run on imported coal to meet their requisite imports set for the year the power ministry also asked utilities to increase coal imports for blending fitch ratings however said that high international coal prices would limit any significant increase in imports coal india was caught unprepared by the surge in electricity demand after the third wave of the pandemic the long standing problem of insufficient railway rates to transport coal from pit heads to power plants added to the woes Eliminating chronic short and long-term deficiencies in coal supply logistics and better interministerial planning can help solve India's power shortages. सब अच्छी दिख रही हैं यार कौन सी खरीदूं ये तो वही बात हुई चार हजार शेयर्स लिस्टेड है कौन सा लूं वो तो सबसे आसान है तुझे फाइव पैसा नहीं पता शह अब तो सबको पता है फाइव पैसा पर है चार हजार स्टॉक्स की रिसर्च टेक्निकल टूल्स और इन्वेस्टमेंट आइडियाज डाउनलोड फाइव पैसा नाउ अब तो सबको पता है इन्वेस्टिंग मेड इजी एंड रिपोर्टिंग विद फाइव पैसा इन्वेस्टमेंट इन सिक्योरिटीज मार्केट आर सब्जेक्ट टू मार्केट रिस्क रीड ऑल द रिलेटेड डॉक्यूमेंट्स केयरफुल बिफोर इन्वेस्टिंग जस्ट लाइक कोल एंड इलेक्ट्रिसिटी द डिमांड फॉर मास्क इज गोइंग अप केसेस ऑफ कोविड नाइनटीन आर राइजिंग इन सेवर पार्ट ऑफ द कंट्री So at a time when the economy is still reeling under the impact of the previous wave and simultaneously trying to absorb the shock of the Russia-Ukraine war, the severity of a possible fourth wave may well have far-reaching consequences. Business Standards Bhaskar Kumar spoke to Professor K. Srinath Reddy, President of Public Health Foundation of India, about how the fourth wave is likely to play out. the center recently advised delhi uttar pradesh haryana maharashtra and mizoram uh, to maintain strict watch and take preemptive action if necessary uh, in areas to control any emerging spread of corona virus uh, we now also have the precaution dose or what we call the third shot of covid-19 vaccine available to all indian adults at private vaccination centers my first question is given the sort of numbers we are seeing at present uh if and when is the fourth wave likely to hit and how severe will it be it depends upon what we mean by the fourth wave if we are talking about rising number of persons infected even mildly or asymptomatically certainly we are seeing the numbers going up and they may go up even further as immunity wanes and people become extremely mobile and start discarding the covid appropriate behavior however if we are really talking about what matters which is how many people are getting seriously ill requiring hospitalization getting intensive care or even perhaps facing the threat of death then those numbers are going to be very small so we are not going to see a fourth wave in that sense the number of cases going up as mild infections should not really threaten us very much you say that the fourth wave is likely that i guess to be milder but uh, would you say that we are well placed in terms of our strategy in handling it if it does come in terms of our booster strategy in terms of our measures for slowing down transmission i think in terms of the transmission containment measures we relaxed too early in fact i think for many of the states especially in the national capital region uh, to have said that you can completely dispense with masks was i think very premature 
we must recognize that even people who have acquired immunity, whether from vaccination or prior infection, they still run the risk of getting infected if they expose themselves to an actively circulating virus. So discarding masks right now was inappropriate. We should have done our uh, transmission containment withdrawal strategy in stages, permitting travel, permitting even shopping, permitting even other gatherings, but with insistence on masks in indoor locations, particularly those which are ill-ventilated, and large crowded gatherings where people are standing together or sitting together for a long period of time. But giving the people the wrong signal by saying, it's all right, now you can discard your mask, move around without any fear, without any concern, uh, I think that was the wrong signal. Coming to booster shots, uh, who should be taking them? Uh, when, should, uh, when should they be taking them? And what about, uh, you know, what should the gap be between the second and the booster dose? Well, I think the government has very clearly given its um, recommendations and we should follow whatever are the recommendations of the government. I don't think we have much of a choice there. But the important element is to recognize that the booster experience in Western countries is different from the booster experience in India for two reasons. One is the mRNA vaccines, which have been extensively used in Western countries, have a much shorter duration of immune protection. Uh, the Pfizer starts waning off in terms of effect from the fifth month onwards, and the Moderna from about the sixth month onwards. So that's why they are requiring boosters early on from the fifth month. Whereas our vaccines, it appears, may have a longer period of protection. But we also have had substantial exposure to the Delta virus in 2021 and an early exposure to Omicron in January this year. So many people are already protected either because of vaccines or because of the virus infection or a combination of both. And therefore the government is adopting the policy that the booster shots can be spaced a little more rather than having them crowded together. Keeping with the topic of booster shots, uh, is this going to be now a regular occurrence? Or is it going to be like a ritual that we'll have to go through every year or a few months? If you actually listen to the manufacturers of the mRNA vaccines, Pfizer and Moderna, they are suggesting that everybody should get a booster annually. However, that may not be really required. Firstly, it depends upon whose immunity is waning to an extent that it puts them at danger. These are elderly people and people who are immunocompromised. Young adults may not necessarily have that level of a feeble immunity because we still do not know how long the immunity provided by the T cells and the memory cells is going to be in effect. We are still learning about it. But the risk is likely to be lower for younger people with a fairly robust immune response and a good memory stored in their immune system. Also, it depends upon whether the virus itself is evolving to become more infectious, but less virulent. That is usually the course of evolutionary biology, but we cannot predict that for certainty in this virus, we'll have to keep a watch. If you see the progressive evolution of the virus into Omicron and its subvariants, including the recent XC form, the infectivity is increasing markedly now, but the virulence has not changed. If at all, it may be slightly lower. We'll have to keep a watch. And in case we find a more virulent virus variant appearing for whatever reasons, uh, then we may have to really step up our boosters for everybody. But this is an evolving area of scientific information. And we may have to revise our estimates and recommendations down the road, maybe after three months or four months. Thank you so much for your time, sir. Have a good day. Thank you. Yaal? Don't ask me. Then he got in the stocks. With that, he balanced the balance with bonds, insurance, gold. He's very good. You don't know five money? Now you know everyone. Five money and all-in-one account. Download five money now. Now you know everyone. Invest made easy and rewarding. With five paisa. Investments in securities market are subject to market risks. Read all the related documents carefully before investing.
Markets too are keeping fingers crossed as cases soar again. Meanwhile, after a decade of downtrend, rising investments in industrial and household segments, bottoming out of prices and sustained demand have brightened the outlook for the real estate sector. But as recovery remains uneven between housing and commercial space, how should investors play the theme? Watch the next report to know. Fortunes are finally favoring the real estate sector, which has been facing slowdown since fiscal year 2012. As per the National Accounts Statistics 2022, nominal gross fixed capital formation grew at a CAGR of 6.5% since FY12 to reach 52.6 trillion rupees in FY21. It, however, underperformed nominal GDP, which grew at a CAGR of 9.5% over the same period. Household sector and private corporates contributed 74% to gross fixed capital formation in FY21, although down sharply by 500 basis points since FY12 when they contributed 79%. Within this, the contribution of real estate, including dwellings and other structures, to GFCF fell drastically by 1,200 BPS from 37.4% in FY12 to 25.4% in FY21. However, after the decadal downtrend, rising animal spirits towards investments are visible within private corporates in industrial sectors and household real estate. Though various steps were undertaken towards reforming the sector, such as the Real Estate Regulation and Development Act of 2016, the impact on the demand front was not visible immediately. However, post the initial lockdown in the wake of the COVID-19 pandemic, the industry has seen a significant recovery. A culmination of various factors, including stagnant real estate prices in the preceding years, healthy growth in salary levels for white-collar jobs, all-time low interest rates and government incentives had resulted in significant improvement in affordability levels. At the same time, the sustained period of work from home since the pandemic outbreak has resulted in strong preference towards home ownership that to larger and better houses. These factors have resulted in demand recovery, especially for the larger and branded real estate developers. However, the recovery trends are mixed across segments as the housing segment is seeing robust demand while commercial real estate is still lagging. Talking about real estate, especially commercial real estate, and even within commercial real estate, leasable office space, the prospects are a mixed bag. We don't really know what the future holds uh, as organizations are yet to decide whether they will move towards a complete work from office uh, kind of a culture or will make it a hybrid culture or completely move towards a remote working culture. So it's quite a mixed bag here. But at the same time, tier two, tier three cities seem to be offering a great value proposition for uh, storage uh, commercial real estate. Uh, talking about residential real estate, uh, we expect uh, certain factors to support uh, the growth in um, the demand for residential real estate. Uh, the prices of residential real estate seems to have uh, bottomed out uh, or at least cooled down uh, you know relative to what it was a couple of uh, given the inventory unsold inventory situation especially most urban and uh, you know metropolitan cities at least from that standpoint we feel that shouldn't uh, be an issue now and uh, you know as the, the affordable housing uh, plan of the government uh, starts taking flight and as there is a, there is an increased appetite for LIG, MIG sort of housing schemes and uh, you know the PMA, AY really supporting those uh, aspiring for a residential piece of real estate. I feel all these stars are aligned uh, to really stoke the demand. That said, high input costs amid the ongoing Ukraine-Russia war is a near-term overhang. According to National Price Rise Impact Study 2022 by Credi, nearly 40% of real estate developers feel that they will not be able to deliver their projects if the government did not take steps to provide relief from a sharp hike in the prices of construction materials. The survey also revealed that there is a direct increase of approximately 20% in construction costs, which will have a direct bearing on the real estate prices. In terms of the 
capacity utilization in manufacturing sector as well as new project initiations that is the capex plans uh, yes you know there has been a sharp improvement in recent trends uh, having said that there is a pressure on input material cost uh, both in terms of the intensity of the cost increase as well as its trajectory in terms of whether it is going to be transient or permanent and therefore uh, developers will cautiously uh, monitor new project initiations and uh, no one would want to end the uh, project at the wrong side of the cost cycle uh, and therefore you know trading cautiously on that account against this backdrop how should investors play the team so industry would do well and i think it will have healthy margins but at the same time as an end user if i were to just buy and sit on it maybe that's not the best idea so how do you really play it i think the best way to play it is uh, participate in financial instruments that that uh, mimic the sector performance uh, i mean you can uh, invest into mutual funds that are sectorally focused on it and few have come more recently uh, private credit is a great way to play it and there are certain options that are becoming available to do so among individual stocks jm financial prefers dlf macro tech developers and prestige estates while share khan likes mahindra life spaces dlf oberoi realty prestige estates macro tech developers purvankara and arihant superstructures analysts say investors could also play the real estate theme by investing in allied sectors such as home improvement home utilities construction material related commodities and logistics a word of caution would be to not uh, really take this as a blanket uh, sort of an outlook because the, what really matters is the exact sector that you're looking into and the exact uh, companies that you would be looking into as an investor so you know, obviously the standard rules of uh, uh, you know asset evaluation applies on wednesday the nifty realty index ended 0.5% up as against a percent gain in the benchmark indices on a year to date basis though the index has shed 7% relative to benchmark's 1% dip meanwhile stock specific action amid q4 earnings weekly fno expiry and global queues will guide the markets today अब क्या किया शेयर्स में ट्रेडिंग तुम्हें फाइव पैसा नहीं पता ओए, अब तो सबको पता है फाइव पैसा पर मिलते हैं रिसर्च टूल्स पोर्टफोलियो एनालिटिक्स और इन्वेस्टमेंट आइडियाज भी डाउनलोड फाइव पैसा ना अब तो सबको पता है इन्वेस्टिंग मेड इजी एंड रिपोर्टिंग विद फाइव पैसा इन्वेस्टमेंट इन सिक्योरिटीज मार्केट आर सब्जेक्ट टू मार्केट रिस्क रीड ऑल द रिलेटेड डॉक्यूमेंट केयरफुल बिफोर इन्वेस्टिंग From the hustle and bustle of Mumbai's Dalal Street, let's move on to quiet lanes of Zurich, Basel, and Geneva in Switzerland, which house a number of banks famous for stashing huge amounts of wealth shielded by countries' age-old secrecy laws. Our next report tries to demystify the aura of secrecy around these Swiss banks and tells about the laws governing them. Early Swiss laws protecting the identity of clients were codified way back in 1713 AD by authorities in Geneva, a city which by then had become a refuge for the wealth of French royalty and European elites. Since then, the notion of secrecy has always been at the center of all the banking laws formed in Switzerland, a small European country tucked between snow-capped Alps. and about 80 years ago in 1934 a law made sharing client information with foreign countries a criminal offense article 47 of the swiss banking act said that without the customer's consent and in the absence of a criminal complaint revealing client's details to almost anyone including the government would be a crime a violation could land a person in question in prison for 5 years and over the years the country became a magnet for tax dodging people and entities around the world they parked their money to evade taxes in their countries denting their government's exchequers 
but some sort of watershed moment came in May 2014, when over 50 countries signed a declaration prepared by the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development. The countries, for the first time, agreed on global exchange of information about their respective taxpayers' financial information. Switzerland, too, promised to share information about client bank accounts. But early this year, a leak of Credit Suisse data again triggered a debate around the banking laws of the Alpine country. The alleged leak revealed that the bank's clients were involved in torture, drug trafficking and money laundering. Meanwhile, back home in India, the hunt for black money is still on. Prime Minister Narendra Modi wrote to power in 2014, promising to bring it back. But in July 2021, a news agency reported that Minister of State for Finance, Pankaj Chaudhary, had told the Lok Sabha that the government had no official estimate of the black money kept in Swiss banks for the past 10 years. Since 2018, India and Switzerland have a system of automatic exchange of information in tax matters. Under it, in September 2019, for the first time, detailed financial information on all Indian residents with accounts in Swiss financial institutions was provided to Indian authorities. But most experts believe that the official data given by the Swiss banks is that of the legal wealth parked by Indians there. The black money reaches Swiss banks after travelling through five to six tax havens, like Jersey Island to Havana. This process is called layering, which makes it very difficult for authorities to trace the trail. Meanwhile, India has passed a black money law that arms its taxmen to go after citizens with secret foreign bank accounts and assets. Citing lawyers, a Financial Daily report said that close to half a dozen appeals are coming up for hearing in Switzerland courts. The petitions want to stop Swiss authorities from sharing information with India. The grounds for appeal are that the Indian law can be applied retroactively and that it can be used to impose criminal sanctions that would be stricter than those that would have applied at the time the offences were committed originally. Swiss National Bank data show that in 2020, funds kept by Indian individuals and companies in Swiss banks rose to their highest level in 13 years. Clearly, despite all the negative connotations, Swiss banks continued to be popular. We Indians disagree on everything, but we agree SBI is the banker to every Indian. Are SBI contactless debit card? I agree. SBI is the banker to every Indian. According to a report, almost half of the 7.9 trillion Swiss francs or 8.59 trillion dollars of assets under management in Switzerland belong to foreign clients. Well, that's all we have for you today. We will be back with more news and analysis in our next episode. Stay tuned. Thank you for watching. If you like this video, share it and subscribe to Business Standard. For more news, views and insights, log on to www.business-standard.com. Do also follow us on YouTube, Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, Telegram and LinkedIn.